Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with biologist and apologist Jonathan McClatchy. The interview is conducted today by Carson Whitenauer. And now here's Carson to introduce our guest. Hello, I'm Carson Whitenauer, and today's interview is with Jonathan McClatchy, who is an apologist and a proponent of intelligent design. Jonathan has earned an honors degree in forensic biology at the University of Strathclyde and a master's degree in evolutionary biology at the University of Glasgow. Jonathan blogs at evolutionnews.org and uncommondescent.com, where he has developed a reputation for detailed studies in the biological systems related to intelligent design. Jonathan, it is a pleasure to be talking with you today. Thank you for having me on the program today. Well, Jonathan, to begin our interview, can you give us some background about your current work and your journey to where you are today? Sure. Well, I was raised in a Christian home. I uh, became a Christian in 1996, um, at the age of about seven. Um, I became very interested in apologetics um, and theology and science and through, as, as I began my science degree uh, back in 2007, um, particularly as I progressed in my science degree, I became very aware um, of the unambiguous and clear evidence of design in biology. Um, you know, I was often you know, baffled at how anyone could go through a four-year college program in biology and come at an atheist the other end. There was just so much clear evidence of information processing and retrieval systems and, you know, the, um, the regulatory control of the cell cycle, you know, these rotary motors and sliding clamps that are the bread and butter of um, biological systems, you know, these are um, very difficult to explain without um, intelligent agency and in, in our um, um, and our cause and effect experience of the um, of the nature of the world, um, we know that these these types of co these types of effects routinely trace their origin back to an intelligent co source. And so I became very interested in this question of biological origins. Um, and so I, I've been I'm very active on the blogosphere and um, in um, discussions with people and um, really trying to um, get this um, to to get to encourage people to explore this topic. Well, we're going to get into all of those details. That's really fascinating the way you would say, how can you go through a four-year degree in biology and come out an atheist? Because, of course, I think that's a fairly common perception of what a degree in science would do. And it's encouraging to see that you've seen much more of a connection between rigorous intellectual study in the sciences and your faith in God. Can you say more about the nature of your relationship with God and how you came to faith and, and how your faith in particular has been strengthened by uh, worshiping God with your mind and investigating the sciences? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, I, I became a Christian in 1996 and um, I became interested in apologetics um, somewhat later, about a decade later, as I um, as I entered university, the university level. and. Um, um, I became very interested in you know, why um, I believe Christianity to be true, or is it true? You know, I mean, there are people of other worldviews that hold to very different positions. Um, I've interacted um, with the many uh, people of other worldviews persuasions, such as Muslims and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, I became very interested in why Christianity in particular is true. You know, if you speak to people of other worldview persuasions, it's often the answer you will get if you ask them for rational justification of their, of their belief system is, well, you know, I, I have this spiritual experience or I, I just have this feeling that it's true, particularly with Mormons, it will tell you that they prayed and received a burning in their bosom. Um, and I, you know, I'm interested in objective facts that are publicly accessible. Um, and I think the Christianity, the evidence for Christianity is very compelling, um, particularly the evidence for the resurrection and the, um, the, the evidence from you know, the, um, the messianic types and foreshadows the way that the cross is the culmination of all the scripture, the, um, the evidence for the divine self-understanding of Jesus and you know, the general reliability of the New Testament. Uh, and when you take it as a cumulative argument, I've always found that um, pretty compelling. Um, I find the evidence for the existence of God to be very um, overwhelming, um, even more compelling than the evidence for Christianity in particular, um, particularly, when, um, particularly the biological evidence, which is my own area of specialization, but also er um, evidence from physics, um, such as the, the Kalam cosmological argument, that, um, the fine-tuning argument that the universe not only began to exist at one point, one defined point in the, in the um, non-infinite past, but also began to, um, it also came into being with immense precision and fine-tuning and optimization. And that, to me, um, when taken as a cumulative argument, strongly suggests design. And so that's you know, really how I got into this. And I've been um, involved in dialoguing with people on the internet and Facebook and in person, um, and trying to find out why they believe what they believe and, um, and give alternative um, points of view. 
I'm really encouraged, and I hope our listeners get that as a takeaway, that you haven't lived out your Christian beliefs in a non-rational bubble of, of faith and, and authority and dogma, but in dialogue with people from many different worldviews, and obviously with a wide range of intellectual investigation from uh, theistic arguments to specifically Christian arguments. And I think that's commendable and something we ought to uh, dedicate ourselves to. Now, within that general framework of, uh, as an apologist, it's clear that your specialty is intelligent design. And I'm wondering if, if today we can try and get an intelligent design 101 tutorial for our listeners. And, and to get us started, how would you define, after all of your research, intelligent design? So intelligent design is a study of patterns in nature which are best explained as the product not of undirected material processes of chance and necessity, but rather of an intelligent causal agent. Um, so intelligent design is already part of the natural sciences. If you look at um, forensic science, for example, which is what my first degree was in, you know, the, the, the whole discipline th thrives in being able to discern, you know, did, did someone um, die of natural causes or were they uh, murdered? You know, that's the design inference. Um, and, you know, there's, there's design inferences when you investigate arsons, for example, or, or fraudulent um, claims. There are um, there is design inferences made in archaeology. You know, the SETI program all the time you know, is looking for extraterrestrial intelligence and you know looking for um, radio waves that may be sent to try to communicate us from an extraterrestrial civilization. You know, many of your listeners may have seen the movie Contact, um, where um, SETI researchers um, in this fictional um, narrative, you know, they receive signals from interspace space that um, were the first, um, what was it, 20 prime numbers, um, which, you know, is, is very difficult to um, explain as a product of simply random noise, and in fact is better explained by an intelligent cause. And so in intelligent design is already part of our mode of reasoning, and the reason we infer to in intelligence as part of our daily routine lives. Um, and the theory of intelligent design is applied to biology is taking those method, methods of design detection, this design inference, and applying it to what we find in biological systems, such as you know, bacterial flagella, which is a rotary motor engine which propels many motile bacteria through, li through liquid. Um, and look, uh, looking at you know the um, DNA and, and the hereditary molecules of DNA and RNA and how they um, serve as mediums for information, how they um, how um, DNA is taken and is transcribed into a, an intermediary molecule called messenger RNA and that's subsequently translated into proteins. That information um, processing and retrieval mechanism. You know, it's best explained by an intelligent cause because we know when we look at um, information in every other realm of experience, whether it be a newspaper headline or whether it be a computer programming script or whether it be the text and the pages of a book, whenever we trace the source of that, that information, it routinely comes back to an intelligent cause. And so that's um, basically the essence of the design hypothesis. I think it's helpful that you're explaining this uh, the analogy of a design inference in a lot of fields that people are familiar with and that therefore this is not anything unusual or out of the ordinary or illegitimate when we move to the biological sciences. Now in explaining what intelligent design was you, you gave us some helpful uh, examples that of the information in DNA and of some functionality in the bacterial um, the bacteria's uh, flagellum and I'm, I'm wondering can you explicate for us what are the top reasons why you think intelligent design is the best scientific theory for explaining the diversity of life we see on this earth. <coughs> right, so um, the, the, the in inference that intelligent design is predica predicated upon and you know, traces its origin back to um, a methodology pioneered by the great 19th century geologist Charles Lyell who wrote a very famous book in the history of science called Principles of Geology being the attempt to understand changes in the earth's surface with reference to causes now in operation. And so this, um, so Charles Lyell argued in this book that um, if one wants to um, infer a cause for an event in the remote past, one should let one's, cause, um, one's present cause and effect experience guide their search for that best explanation. And so when it comes to you know, explaining, for example, the presence of volcanic ash, we favor the volcanic eruption hypothesis over the earthquake hypothesis because in our uniform repeated experience, our cause and effect experience, the only known source of you know, volcanic ash is um, an earth is, is, a, is a volcanic eruption, not an earthquake, and so um, we we reason back, we extrapolate back from our present experience into the past. And when when we're talking about information, you know, we have um, we have 
plenty of information in our modern era. We look at information and we know that every time information arises, it traces its origin back to an intelligent source. Um, so, so j just like as we do in other scientific disciplines, we are inferring to the best explanation for multiple competing hypotheses, and we know that intelligence is known to produce uh, large volumes of complex and functionally specific information, whereas other causes like um, you know, natural selection, random genetic mutation, genetic drift, are, are shown to be impotent in producing that information. Um, and so that would be the, um, the, the design inference and why I think is uh, the best explanation. So. How do you can you say more about the design um, filter and, and how that works out? What, what do you, how do you define that? How do you apply it in, in say one case? Right. So um, basically, there are two criteria necessary to establish a design inference. One is complexity. So something must be exceedingly complex, and, and the complexity should should exhaust the probabilistic resources at one's disposal. So when we're talking about you know the origin of life, you're looking at um, the world of the cell. Um, is the complexity of the cell so um, so substantial that it actually exhausts the probabilistic resources available since, uh, say, the beginning of the universe would be a very um, um, a, a generous um, estimate. Um, so, in, in, in tel in, so the second criterion that it must that it must be is, is it must be functionally specific. In other words, it must conform to an independently given specified pattern. So. Um, so, for example, um, in, a, in a paragraph of text, you know, any given sequence of the, of the letters in that paragraph of text are equally improbable. There's no, uh, if you assume that um, all the characters are available for every um, digit, um, all, the, all, all the potential sequences are equally improbable, and yet there's, there's only a sp small subset within that, you know, within that combinatorial sequence space, if you will. There's only a small subset of sequences of, of alphabetic characters would actually convey some sort of meaning, and that would be what we would call specified. So if it's complex and it's specified, we um, infer that it, in fact, has an intelligent cause. Right. So how is this different from the mainstream theory of evolution? Can you define the mainstream theory for us and then explain some of the conceptual differences between that and intelligent design? So the main, mainstream neo-Darwinian theory would maintain that life is the product of an entirely um, unguided um, process involving various um, natural processes, including natural selection, random genetic mutation, genetic drift, symbiogenesis, and other um, processes which have no um, mind um, involved. Whereas intelligent design would argue to the contrary that in fact intelligence is indispensable in accounting for the origins of life. Um, so it would argue, for example, that you know the specified complexity found in um, uh, amino acid residues that make up proteins. You know, amino acids are um, are subunits of proteins, and, and they're they're arranged in the the, um, the sequential arrangement of the amino acids determines how a protein uh, will collapse into a into a functional structure, a stable and functional structure, and how that will then move out into the cell and, and perform some biochemical role. So now. Do you think that holding to intelligent design involves a wholesale rejection of the neo-Darwinian synthesis of evolution, or do you see them as, as being integrated together in some fashion? I see them as, um, well, int intelligent design doesn't necessarily reject the proposition of universal common ancestry. That's not what is challenging. So if by evolution you simply mean universal common ancestry, then intelligent design and evolution are perfectly compatible. If, however, you mean by evolution this whole notion that life is the product of a purely chance necessity process, then I would say they are in fact not compatible because intelligent design maintains that life is the product of intelligence. Um, so. Um, so there's, I mean, there's different definitions of evolution. There's um, the proposition that life simply changes over time, the changes in allele frequency that occur in a population over time, or there's the proposition that all of life share um, common ancestors. Um, and the further you trace um, back our, an our history, um, we, the more all of life comes back to uh, common ancestors until eventually you come to a single universal common ancestor, which was the progenitor of all future life. Um, or there's the proposition that life is the product of um, unguided, blind, chance necessity processes involving processes like natural selection, genetic drift, random genetic mutation, um, and that's um, uh, that view that life is the exclusive product of chance and necessity is un, un, incompatible with ID, and that's in fact what ID is challenging. Now, in fact, many many individual ID proponents will take uh, views on common ancestry, and many of us disagree with common ancestry, but that's not part of what ID is challenging. 
they say it's helpful to have that kind of nuance uh, that the intelligent design movement and uh, mainstream evolutionary theory are interacting on a range of issues and we've got to be clear about exactly what is being challenged in terms of these scientific theories. Now, the ID movement, as I'm sure you're aware, is quite a controversial uh, hypothesis. And why do you think that is? What, what's at stake in this disagreement between uh, evolutionary proponents and the intelligent design movement? Well, I think you know evolutionary theory is uh, unique among many scientific disciplines because it um, it's so closely wedded to the materialistic worldview, um, and you know, people. Um, Understandably, when their worldview is challenged, react sometimes um, in very emotional and sometimes irrational ways. And uh, I think uh, this is um, one explanation for much of the hostility within the academic community towards intelligent design proponents. Um, intelligent design, you know, it doesn't, it, it isn't based on, you know, um, metaphysical premises. It's not based on religious. Um, and particularly particular um, interpretations of religious scripture, and it's not it's not based on um, on a particular worldview like Christianity or anything like that. And but intelligent design uh, may have met larger metaphysical religious worldview implications, and a lot of people don't like um, the potential metaphysical implications of intelligent design. But one has to bear in mind that evolutionary theory also has um, larger metaphysical implications. And if life is a product of a chance, necessity, unguided process then is that really compatible with um, a traditional understanding of God's providence in nature? You know, is he, um, it, can God um, direct um, an unguided process that, um, um, that um, view being logically incoherent? Um, and so that seems to me to be very problematic. So there's, there's no way to avoid metaphysics in our That's correct. approach to science. That's correct. Well now, some of the critics of intelligent design have raised some challenging questions to the view you've just presented and understandably they would say, no, no, this isn't about my worldview. This isn't an emotional issue for me. Uh, I'm not being irrational. Rather, I have a, a principled and reasoned objection to the intelligent design movement. And one of the objections they would raise is that it's really not possible to detect intelligent design through scientific study. And um, that's a unwarranted going beyond the evidence. How would you respond to that challenge? Well, my response would be that we already do detect intelligent design um, in our everyday lives, in our routine experience. You know, we, we read um, newspaper headlines and we immediately infer that these were in fact designed. You know, Richard Dawkins, when he wrote uh, The God Delusion, you know, we, when we read his book, we, um, we immediately infer that that book arose by some sort of intelligent agency. Um, so, you know, we look at, you know, Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, you know, we see President Spaces carved into the rock there and we, uh, we immediately infer that someone spent um, a, lot of a lot of time working on that and someone, some intelligent agency um, produced that, you know, we've got this uh, method of pattern recognition, we know that specified complexity routinely originates from intelligent source and we don't presently know of any cause that produces specified, in specified complexity apart from intelligence. So, I mean, it's, um, I mean it's, it, intelligent design is based on the standard um, principles of scientific methodology. This inference to the best explanation for multiple computing hypotheses, you know, is held tentatively. Um, so it, it, it's possible that in the future some explanation of specified complexity could come along and displace intelligent design. But as things stand at present, it is currently the, the most causally efficacious or the most causally adequate or the best explanation for what we see. Right. Uh well, some might say, okay, we can detect intelligent design when we look at Mount Rushmore or a newspaper, but how would we detect intelligent design in the emergence of more developed life forms? How do we specify, okay, here's the moment when the intelligent designer acted and took the species from this developmental form to that developmental form? How do we get to a specificity of identifying the active work of some kind of intelligent designer. So, in, in the case of the origin of life, for example, we can look at, um, at, spe at cases of specified complexity, such as the information necessary to construct the polypeptide chains that constitute proteins, or looking at you know the the right true molecules of, of DNA and RNA. Probably RNA was the first genetic material, um, and we. Um, we can infer that you know a, a specified complexity these um, um, is required to explain these. I mean, spe um, the, the, the 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 prevalence of 
functional, stable protein folds within um, sequence space or the, the, the vast array of combinatorial possibilities of arranging amino acids is astronomically small. Uh, and this, uh, to me, is a, is a tremendous challenge to um, neo-Darwinism, and yet it, um, it's, it conveys information. Um, it's, it's complex, it's specified, it's specif it conveys specified complexity, um, and that is the criterion by which we detect intelligent design. So um, when, when, we're, when we're looking at you know, the Cambrian explosion is another case. So it's you know uh, 530 million years ago, the, the most of the major animal body plans um, called, called the phyla appear very abruptly within a very narrow geological window of time, so five to ten million years, um, and they require you know lots of cases of uh, morphological innovation, anatomical novelty, and um, and that's another case where you know in, intelligence. Um, and must play an indispensable role in accounting for it. You know, the origins of compound eyes and trilobites, for example, the origins of body plants, the origins of these <coughs> proteins and genetic material and um, regulatory circuits that are required to explain um, development in, um, in animals. You know, all of these arise within a very narrow window of time without clear predecessors in the Precambrian, in the Precambrian strata. Does the intelligent design hypothesis lead us to understand a, a fairly active intelligent designer of some kind who is quite regularly intervening in the development of life and here, you know, new body form and here, um, you know, new uh, development of proteins and here, uh, a better eye. And so on a fairly regular basis, there's some kind of intelligent intervention uh, throughout the, hu the animal species and bacteria and so on to develop more complex life? Well, one could uh, take that position, but there are um, there are a number of positions that one could take on this, a number of ways of looking at this question. So um, one hypothesis, for example, is that you know, the, um, the world was set up um, in, and had the world, the world has some sort of intrinsic teleology or intrinsic intelligence built into it. Perhaps, I mean, this is even compatible with a theistic understanding of the universe where God sets up the world in such a way that it will give rise to these structures and these systems and these, this anatomical complexity. So that's one way of looking at it. Or you could take, um, as you just described, the interventionalist view. Um, now, I, I'm pr fairly agnostic on that question. I, didn't, uh, I mean, I, do, I don't think the evidence is... Um, um, is entirely um, ambigu uh, unambiguous one way or the other on that question. Now, another criticism that, that's been raised of intelligent design is that it's only a God of the gaps theory. And do you think there are cases where the intelligent design framework has led or been a God of the gaps uh, approach? And how do we avoid that uh, so that we are making a distinction between intelligent design approaches and God of the gaps thinking? So the God of the gaps argument would be to say that since I can't explain phenomenon X, therefore I, I um, plug in God to explain it, and God becomes a placeholder for what we don't know and what we can't explain yet. Whereas intelligent design isn't like that at all. It doesn't work that way. Intelligent design argues that there, there are certain phenomena which are best explained by intelligent causes. And so when we see information in all of our experience, we, can, we know that it traces its origin back to an intelligent source, and therefore we can infer um, intelligent design as the best, the currently best explanation for what we find in biology. Um, if intelligent design makes any positive arguments at all, it's not by definition a God of the gaps argument, and therefore whatever else may be wrong with it, it's definitely not wrong because it's a God of the gaps argument. Um, and many um, um, people I've spoken with who are critics of intelligent design have conceded that much that whatever else may be wrong with it is not God of the gaps of argument. So it's, it's based not on what we don't know, but what, what we do know about the complexity of biological systems was it, was it needed to explain our innovation and what um, and what in all of our uniform repeated experience of cause and effect is known to produce information and that one cause is intelligence and therefore I would argue that intelligent design is not a God of the gaps argument. So to make sure I understand you correctly, a God of the gaps approach is an argument from ignorance, which is a logical fallacy. You're saying, I don't know how to do this, and the convenient answer is to say, the designer did it. But what you're saying is intelligent design has a definition for detecting design and saying, okay, if we have you know, specified complexity and these other features, then it's right to infer an intelligent actor. And when we look at biological systems, we find that that definition is met. And that's why we're making this um, inference from the biological systems to the activity of an intelligent designer.
And that's, that's a positive right. case. That's right. And in fact, there is um, a converse fallacy, which is committed on the material side of this, of this discussion, where they will say, well, we can't explain it yet. And so we'll just plug in, you know, we'll, we'll come up with a materialistic explanation at some point in the future. And this is uh, like what you might call a materialism of the gaps fallacy. In fact, there's a very similar fallacy um, involved in one of the major arguments for um, Darwinism, which is um, offered, for example, by Francis Collins in his book, The Language of God. Um, this whole notion of junk DNA, um, you know, it's the case that what, only 1.5% of um, our DNA, in fact, codes for proteins, and the rest of our DNA is non-coding DNA, it doesn't code for proteins. Um, and one interpretation of this is that much of the rest of it, um, with rare exception, is in fact non-functional. It doesn't um, have any function, and this is the, um, and this is explained as as a result of these blind, undirected, purposeless processes. And this is just the um, this, this is just the accumulation of garbage in our genome that's resulted from this this um, blind, undirected, unintelligent process. Whereas this argument has come under fire in recent years with uh, this um, onslaught of evidence. That in fact the non-coding regions are in fact um, have pervasive function, um, and so the argument for Darwinism that Francis Collins and, and many others have articulated in fact shrinks with each new advance in scientific understanding. And so I would describe that as closer to a, um, a, a God of the gaps fallacy than it would intelligent design. So I think that's a, a broader principle here for our listeners is that um, logical fallacies are a human phenomenon and not necessarily a religious phenomenon or an religious phenomenon, but that every community is suspect to these logical fallacies and we have to exercise due diligence to uh, treat our own position with skepticism and challenge it to see if we are thinking with rigor. Now, to challenge the intelligent design theory, how could we falsify it? What evidence would make you go, you know what, the biological systems are not intelligently designed? How would is that a possibility? How would that come about? Sure, intelligent design could be falsified. So um, it's based on two premises. Uh, the design inference is based on two premises. There's premise one, it, biological systems are chock full of specified complexity. And premise two, uh, intelligence is the best explanation for specified complexity. Um, so if you could show that either of those two premises is false, then intelligent design as an inference would be falsified. So you could show, um, for example, that there are other causes which produce specified complexity or that life doesn't in fact contain specified complexity. Say you were, you, you were to demonstrate that in fact um, the prevalence of um, stable and functional protein flows within sequence space is in fact quite amenable to a step-by-step -step gradualistic Darwinian pathway. Um, so um, they, it wouldn't in fact exhibit specified complexity. Then you know that would um, that would refute the design hypothesis. So I, I think there are ways to falsify ID. And that, I think, creates a, a lively debate about, about the premises, but at least they're clear and at least they're open for discussion. Mm -hmm. So what predictions has intelligent design generated? How, how have these predictions been confirmed? What, what kind of uh, scientific support do you think the movement enjoys? So one prediction intelligent design makes is that because when intelli generally when intelligent designers and intelligent agents act, they produce things which are functional in some way, they convey meaning. And so when we look at you know the non-coding regions of our DNA, we, even though it wasn't known a decade ago what much of this was doing, um, we, we were able to predict, in fact, that much of it would turn out to have function. And although we don't know what the majority or and we don't know what the majority of our DNA is doing at present, we at the the trend has been for the preponderance of our DNA to turn out, in fact, to have function. So that would be one prediction which I would say is confirmed. Um, I'd say that the converse of that, um, that much of our DNA would not be functional, is in fact a prediction which uh, flows very readily from a Darwinian view of um, the origins and development of life. Um, I'd say another prediction is that you know, when we look at biological systems, we should find specified complexity because that's what intelligent design would predict. And I think you know, Doug Axe's research, for example, in 2004 in the Journal of Molecular Biology, um, which estimated the prevalence of um, amino acid sequences adopting stable and functional folds, um, he looked at a particular enzyme called beta-lactamase, which is involved in conferring antibiotic resistance um, to certain bacteria, and um, that and, and that's a, a, another case of a confirmed prediction. So um, I, I'd say that there are many predictions that ID makes. Another one would be 
um, that you know as as time progresses, we will find more and more factors um, that are finely tuned in our universe, more and more constants and um, and conditions that need to be uh, finely tuned, uh, both for the universe's existence as a whole and for um, the evolution or origins of advanced intelligent life on Earth. So I mean, there's, these are the three predictions, but and ID makes many more. And would you say that you know if someone's doing biological sciences and they go into the lab looking for specified complexity, do you think that would accelerate their research program uh, and actually lead to better and stronger scientific results? Yeah, I think it could um, produce um, more results. I think intelligent design has uh, much heuristic value in that regard. In fact, uh, intelligent design, you know, is, um, has much promising potential. And I think if it becomes, um, you know, we, uh, for example, um, in the case of non-coding DNA, you know, it, it could accelerate. And taking the, the intelligent design standpoint, could accelerate um, the process by which we elucidate functions for this DNA because we expect it to turn out to have function. And so, using intelligent design as um, as a theory, um, a, an approach to scientific research, I think could in fact um, hold much heuristic value. That's very interesting. So now we've covered a lot of different issues, both arguments for intelligent design and looked uh, provisionally at some of the challenges to it. What would you say to people who are listening to this program who are, who are on the fence and they're really not sure who to believe or who to trust or uh, how to weigh the evidence? What would be your words to them as they think about uh, the theory of intelligent design? Well, I would say to read as much of the literature on both sides of this issue. There's a phenomenal new book that has just been published just yesterday, in fact, by um, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who's a Cambridge-trained philosopher of science. This new book is called Darwin's Doubt, and it explores many of the challenges to the neo-Darwinian synthesis and also presents a positive argument for intelligent design. Um, this book focuses um, on the Cambrian explosion, but uses this as a springboard to discuss other issues which are, um, um, for example, how to explain the origins of body plans or how to explain um, the origins of protein folds or how to explain you know, morphological innovation, um, development of gene uh, networks. So um, I'd say to read um, uh, that, I'd also say to read uh, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design, which is um, a great book which focuses on the origins of life on Earth and argues that intelligent design is the best explanation, doesn't just focus on the negative arguments, the, the arguments against materialistic explanations. I'd also um, say um, to read books on the other side of this controversy, um, some books which cover the evidence for evolution, um, Jerry Coyne's book Why Evolution is True, for example, or you could read um, Richard Dawkins' book The Greatest Show on Earth, or there's a classical book by Ernst Mayer called What Evolution Is, which focuses on the basic principles of evolution. Um, and there's many, uh, many more resources that you could find uh, on the internet. There is many listed um, at the Discovery Institute website. There's um, the blog evolutionnews.org where you can follow the latest updates. There's uh, on commondescent.com. And um, I just encourage readers to, to continue to read and, um, and discuss these issues. I think that's a really helpful advice, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned resources on both sides. And as people engage with that, they can uh, really consider the evidence uh, as impartially and objectively as possible. Um, and I hope they'll engage with Dr. Meyer's arguments. I found him to be a very lucid and, and clear writer, and the way he expresses very difficult scientific concepts to be very approachable and uh, accessible to the average reader. Mm -hmm. Well, Jonathan, I'd like to ask, what have you learned from doing apologetics online? You write a lot of blog posts. Uh, they're often very detailed and thorough. What has that process taught you? Um, it's, I guess it's taught me that, you know, to, uh, I'm very interested in, in presenting both sides. I want to be fair to the other side of the discussion, and so I want to state the facts which support not just my own case, but their case as well. Um, so I'm interested in... Um, you know, stating you know where uh, where the balance of evidence lies, usually in controversies like um, in, usually in scientific controversies and um, and controversies relating to um, historiography or scholarship, there are, there are there is evidence on both sides. The evidence isn't all unambiguously on one side of the issue, but there is in fact a balance of evidence, and I'm interested in um, articulating that. And I think that that's been um, it's been helpful to learn that. I've also um, learned, been able to learn from many of my critics, um, particularly on the um, 
intelligent design controversy where I spent most of my effort. I always try to understand where they're coming from and understand and see where my arguments need to be adjusted or refined or uh, revised. Um, I've um, and learned to always to be civil in um, discussions with people. I think that's very important and quality of um, a, of a writer. Um, so the, um, yeah, these these things I would say um, are important. Now that's obviously as someone who does a fair amount of apologetics work online as well. You know, the, the comments section it can be a, a very heated uh, uh, section of internet websites. What spiritual formation practices or community practices or other habits do you have to approach those conversations in a civil way and in a kind way? How do you maintain that approach in, in the impersonal nature of internet dialogue? Um, well, I mean, I, I always try to um, be civil myself, and obviously I can't uh, control how other people behave. I think the moderation of comments and uh, in the context of the blog is important. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say I just try to maintain myself. I try to be a good example, um, and um, I hope other people um, on the other side of this discussion reciprocate that. Yeah, that's the best we can hope for. Um, so now, you clearly do a lot of research in the field. What are some of your work and study habits that others could learn from? Well, I um, I have a, an iPad in which I have um, a, a database that I've constructed of um, thousands of um, scientific papers, and they're all categorized in a nested hierarchical fashion. And I think that's very useful for um, for engaging in scholarship. So I can pull out papers very quickly. I can find them easily. I can pull them up in debates and dialogues. Um, so I've always found that very helpful. Also, I have a massive array of about 400 books on my um, Kindle, which is also on my iPad, so I have access to much um, literature in various disciplines, including um, scientific textbooks, and, um, and I've always found that um, very helpful. Um, I um, also try to write um, literature reviews um, for my own edification so I can keep up with the literature better, um, try to dialogue with people who are scientists and exchange ideas and get feedback on my own arguments. And um, these things I find very helpful as I um, try to um, stay, stay abreast of the current developments. I think those are all really important tips. One of the ones that I found most helpful is that writing literature reviews and summarizing information. And when I engage in that process, I really come to own the material at a far deeper level. And that prepares me to be of better service to others. Well, Jonathan, what would be your final words to our listeners today um, as we close out this interview? Well, I, I'd like to say thanks for having me on, and I've, I've um, enjoyed sharing um, intelligent design and the, the, the principles of it. What I'd say to your listeners is just to uh, keep learning and keep um, researching and, and uh, considering both sides, not just the side you currently agree with, and um, I, I hope you go where the evidence leads. I think that's an excellent uh, way to end, and um, I want to commend that to our listeners as well. And to all of our listeners, please be sure to check out uh, Jonathan's work at UncommonSent.com and EvolutionNews.org. Jonathan, this has been a very informative and encouraging interview. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your insightful perspective. Thanks. This has been an interview with Jonathan McClatchy, conducted by Carson Whitenauer. Find more of Jonathan's articles at EvolutionNews.org and UncommonDescent.com. If you've enjoyed the interview, please share it with a friend via Facebook or Twitter. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash apologetics315 and on Twitter at twitter.com slash apologetics315. Please help us get the word out about good apologetics resources. And I want to thank those who've been supporting Apologetics 315 through their financial gifts and also for those who use our Amazon affiliate links located at the right-hand side of apologetics315.com. When you do your normal shopping from Amazon, using those links allows a small portion of your purchase to support what we're doing, and it only costs you a click. Those links can also be bookmarked for ease of use whenever you shop online. We continue to transcribe these interviews with the help of volunteer transcribers and donations. So if you'd like to help with more, just email me at interviews at apologetics315.com. We are also still interested in developing an iPhone or Android app for Apologetics 315. However, we're looking for developers or funders for this project. So if you're interested in seeing this project take off, you can contact me at brian at apologetics315.com. If you have suggestions for the interviews, you can also email me at interviews at apologetics315.com.
This is Brian Auten, and thanks again for listening.